3D Gaussian splatting is one of the most exciting graphic techniques coming out right now. Thanks to a really awesome tool called PostShot, you can make 3D Gaussian splats at home for free with your computer. Using Gaussian splats is jarring because the results are almost indistinguishable from real life. It accurately recreates the lighting, geometry, shadows, and subtle light artifacts like reflections, specular highlights, subsurface scattering, and more. Even more incredible, this technique can be used for VFX, 3D animation, and video games. It runs super fast, is super easy to set up and the results are just breathtaking. Today we're going to be diving into creating our own Gaussian splats using PostShot and I'll share some tips and tricks as well as some of the limitations so you can determine whether or not 3D Gaussian splats will help you in your creative work. I'm super excited, I know you are too, alright let's go. So the first step is to get some usable footage and this process is almost identical to photogrammetry except it's even more flexible by the end result. Make sure that you have a still subject and get a series of angled shots that have a consistent white balance, exposure, and focus. For a high quality splat, I like to use my phone's camera set to pro mode with the exposure and white balance locked and I also shoot in 60 frames per second and try to make the shutter speed insanely high. The faster your shutter speed, the crisper your video will be and the the better it will be at preventing any motion blur. What's crazy though is that this app can still process footage that's not in the best optimized quality so I've actually been able to pull footage from a movie scene and just about anything and it's worked out so you don't actually need to be as strict with your footage but one thing to note is that if you are using a movie scene or some old footage you may be limited in how many camera movements you can pull off before it starts to look like a Pollock painting. Another way to think about this is the the better your footage is and the capture data that you provide it, the better you will have in flexibility of moving the camera around a scene. Which is essentially what we're trying to do is recreate a very awesome 3D scene where we can have these dynamic sweeping camera movements with photorealistic quality. You may have seen these effects in some music videos as well in a lot of other fun creative works coming out right now. Anyways, let's dive in. Next thing that you want to do is download PostShot. I'll leave a link in that description box but I highly recommend you going to the discord instead because the developer is super responsive and I've even seen him literally send new builds of the program to specific people if they've had an issue. So once we have that installed we can go ahead and open up PostShot. This is what it looks like when you first open up PostShot. You have a main window here, some tools on the side. The cool thing about PostShot is that you can drag in multiple video clips and images for the training so you don't actually need to get everything perfect in one video clip. As long as the image is visually coherent in terms of white balance, exposure, and focus, you can drag in all of your video clips and PostShot will still intelligently 3D track your camera across multiple video clips and put it together. One thing to note though is that once you do import and start training, you cannot add in more clips after the fact. So make sure that you have all of your clips imported first and then you start training. So I want to show you an example of when things are coming out perfectly and then afterwards I'm going to show you an example when you're working with footage that is not perfectly optimized so you may have moving subjects and things like that. For our first clip, here I have a quick 56 second clip of a fire hydrant outside. I'm filming this with my phone and you're going to notice that I'm trying my best to film a full 360 degree view of the object and I'm altering my height and angle of the camera as well as getting really close to capture those minute details. So let's go ahead and drag in this clip into post shot and instantly you'll see an option box for the import settings and these values are intelligently chosen based on your footage. So 98% of the time I actually leave these at their default settings settings, but for those of you who are not getting a decent result or facing performance issues, or maybe you're just working with trickier footage, I'll go over some of these values, what you can change, and how they're going to affect your final result. So for the image selection, it's set to default at use best images, but you can also change it to use all images. Using best images, it'll intelligently select only the best images out of the entire set, whereas all images is useful if you already know that every single image you want it to train on. This will of course increase 
increase the amount of time that it takes for it to train. If you're working with video, I highly recommend leaving it at best images because if it has to process every single frame, it will take forever and you won't actually get that much better of a result for the performance hit. The next setting is max image count, which it is selected at 113 out of 3,385. This value will change based on how long your footage is and what you've imported. This again is very smart and normally picks the best value, but if you wanted to train on either more or less images, you can change the number here. If you're curious as to why it says 3,385 images, that's just how many frames are in my video, which it will extract as an image. The next one, camera poses, isn't really an option. I think it's just really letting you know where the camera's position is getting from, which it's clearly getting from the imported images. Single lens and focal length, you can leave off, but if you wanted to speed up training time and you know that your footage is shot with the same lens and same focal length, then you can check this on and it will be a bit faster. Another thing to note is that while it can take footage from various lenses and focal lengths, I would recommend you avoid doing so for the best result. Maximum features per frame is set to 8K features, which is actually 8,000 features. These are how many points it will use as a reference per image, and raising this will give you more points at the cost of performance. So in theory, it will increase quality while lowering it will decrease quality and be faster. Radiance field profile is set to splat MCMC, but you can actually Actually train nerfs or use splat ADC for your result. My favorite is splat MCMC because it runs the fastest, produces amazing results, and lets you control max splat count rather than ADC, which uses a splat density amount for rendering. Down sampling images, I leave this to checked on because I'm typically working with 4K footage, which is huge, and down sampling to a smaller pixel amount will run faster but look worse, and running the native size will run slower but look slightly better. Honestly, 1600 pixels, I think is more than enough so I typically let it down simple to this amount but you can uncheck this if you're looking to get a little bit more quality. Create a sky model is a feature that you can't turn on without retraining again and I actually normally leave this off because I'm not a fan of how it looks but for this example I'm actually going to turn this on just so that you can see how it looks. It's more of a visual effect for the far distance splats and it doesn't really put a performance hit but I find that it makes the splats less editable in other software which is why I normally leave this turned off. The max splat count is set to 1000 K splats, which actually means 1 million splats, which is a huge amount and I think is going to be more than enough for this scene. I typically leave it if you were to raise this amount, you'll get more quality at a performance hit. If you were to lower this, you would have less quality with faster performance. The next option, start training, is set to checked, which just means that once you click the import button, it's going to automatically start training. And I'm actually going to turn this off. Another option here is stop training after it's checked on and it's set to 30k steps. Now you can set this to stop earlier or later. Earlier will produce a lower quality result while more steps will produce a better result. Though I do believe there is an ability to overtrain a Gaussian splat and I found that cranking it to insane amounts will sometimes produce a result that captures more of the visual artifacts in the footage better than some of the lower step counts which is not actually what we want. So I typically leave this at 30,000 steps and if I need more visual fidelity I'll raise it to 45,000 and then 60,000, but I have found that it diminishes when I try pushing past 120,000 steps, but again, your results may vary. So once all those settings are set, we can hit import and we're gonna get a new set of options here on the right. The first thing that we wanna do is click on store training context. I highly recommend that you do this. That way you're able to pause and start your training, close out of the project, open it back up, and you're not gonna lose any of your progress, which is huge time saver. Next thing that you're gonna wanna do is click save so that you have your project being able to save to a specific place. Fire hydrant splat example, hit save. And then we can go up here and click start training. It gives us a little progress bar. What it's doing in the background is it's taking that video clip and it's extracting images that it will use for the camera training. Most of this is happening on your CPU. So if you have a fast CPU, this process will happen very, very quickly. So normally around the third step, you'll start to see some of the points getting made. And if you wanted to move the camera around, you can just click and drag with your mouse and it moves just like any other 3D program. You can also right click to zoom in and out. And one thing that's really cool about this is that that you can actually see the depth getting changed as it's processing. So it's almost like it's processing
processing each image and then calculating the depth and putting those points in the right space. So we have what looks like a recognizable part of the fire hydrant itself. We also have what looks to be some of the rocks and most of the features are actually getting generated on these rocks because they are such a great source of texture and such a great use for the training sample. In the far background, if we zoom out a little bit, you'll start to see the rest of the space here, which even though we weren't trying to capture, it was a part of the training set in the footage. So we have a little bits of the trees here with the green and then some of the road as well as the sidewalk. Right now though, all we're doing is rendering out a point cloud, which lets us render this out at an insane frame rate. So we're getting pretty much real time here. You can move around and this is not taking any significant processing power on the computer whatsoever. So again, the GPU utilization is using more just for my video recording than it is for creating this scene, which is freaking awesome. Okay, and now that it is done camera tracking, you can start to see all of these start to come in and it's starting to look so much better. It's now training the radiance field, which every step from here, it's only gonna look better and better. Now, if you're curious what all these little symbols are, these little icons are the camera poses. So this was every place where I put my camera and it's honestly crazy to see because I would say it is accurately representing it just based off of the footage that I gave it. Another thing that you're gonna still see are the points. So if you wanted to change some of the rendering here, we can go in and click off the points. We can also turn off the camera poses by checking this here and all you're going to see then is the image. Well, we still have this access bar so we can turn these off as well and you're going to want to leave this last option on because that's actually where the Gaussian splat is. So if you check this off and you don't see anything, that's what happened. It's just not rendering it out. So we can also use the WASD keys to move in, move backwards, truck left and right, almost as if this was a video game, but this is all taken from footage. You can also click the mouse wheel to pan up and down, left and right, just like you would in Blender or another 3D software. Other options here goes into the camera movement. So we can click this one here, which is called camera mode ego. This tries to be a first person perspective mode it's just a little bit different in how it handles your inputs. Another thing that you can do is move around the splats. You have transform options, which are just like any other 3D software as well. So you can translate, you can rotate, you can scale up and down. And since it's training right now, these last two options are turned off and this lets us select certain splats in the scene. So let me go ahead and pause the training so you can take a look at what that looks like. If I go here, we have a circle selector and we can actually select this. And if you move around the camera, you'll see that that is locked in 3D space. And what's crazy about some of the reflective splats is that they're not actually stuck to the surface. So the way that it renders this is that they're very far off in the distance. So this is kind of an interesting effect that happens when you're working with these. Let's go ahead and deselect those and then let's start back with the training. I'm gonna click home to reset the camera and let's go ahead and reposition it so it looks nice. Okay, so this is looking cool and let's go ahead and let it train for a little bit more. You're gonna see here the amount of time that it's been running for. I'm gonna let this run. It's probably gonna take about 25 minutes or so and then we'll check back in and compare the results. Okay, and we have reached the training step limit. I gotta say is looking super awesome, except one thing that you're gonna notice is we are getting a lot of artifacting we did not want in the scene. So even though this looks amazing, we do have a sky model in the background, which you can start to see if we zoom all the way out, that's what it has done. It's created a sky model based off of that splat. I don't normally use this when I'm working with splats because I do like to just isolate them from the environment. So if I did wanna just focus on this fire hydrant, and fix up some of these visual artifacts, like possibly the leaves that were moving in the trees in the background, which have now changed perspective a little bit here. What we can do is go over to the radiance field set over here on the right hand side, click edit, and then check on the crop box here. And we're gonna see it's immediately cropped out some of this. We can mess with these values here so that we can crop out everything else but the object that we actually wanna capture in our Gaussian splat. So 
I'm just gonna be increasing the scale a little bit here. And already this is looking super cool. So I think if you're a visual effects artist, you can imagine this is almost like having a matte box, but for something that is in 3D, which is super cool and really fun to mess around with. But what can you do afterwards? You can go ahead and export this to other software, which is gonna be super helpful. So if you go up to file, check out down here, we can click export splat model. I'm just gonna call this fire hydrant splat example cropped and it's gonna save as a .ply file which if you're working with something like Blender, there is a free Gaussian splatting plugin available that will let you import that PLY file in there. You can also import this into After Effects using a paid plugin. I highly recommend the Gaussian splatting plugin from iRealix because it works really well with After Effects and it offers an insane amount of customization and animating options. So it's so far been the best port in terms of using Gaussian splats with After Effects. I highly recommend this plugin because this has to be the best implementation of Gaussian splatting and After Effects that I've seen. And I've also seen some awesome people making stuff with Unreal Engine and Unity using some paid plugins to import in Gaussian splats. Those results, I gotta say, are breathtaking. So you can only imagine how far this is gonna come in the future once people start implementing this into video games. Here is a more real world example. This is a short 24 second clip of Chriselle at our brother's wedding. Even though she's trying her best to stay still, we're still dealing with a living subject, not something static like rocks and a fire hydrant. There will be micro movements and even more so, there will be moving elements in the background like people walking, cars moving, and wind blowing the trees and leaves and everything. Every subtle movement will get picked up and like we saw earlier, it will create some artifacting, but I want you to take a look at this result and judge for yourself. So here is the final result. I've already gone ahead and cropped it and you can see every single camera movement was tracked. It has this really nice detailed point cloud. And I'm gonna turn some of these off so you can actually see the fidelity that we have in this. This looks amazing, I gotta say. And again, all of this is running in real time. I'm pretty sure we're getting over 100 or 200 frames per second. It's honestly running as fast as my monitor could probably process this. So as one thing I want you to really take note of is that it does capture the amount of detail, but if we were to change some of the camera poses, some of the elements might actually get a little bit messier or if we zoom in or zoom out. So you might notice at this higher angle i don't think i actually recorded the top of her head that much so it's gonna be a bit artifacty and look very strange and you can see it did a really amazing job of capturing the scene it does have a lot of the artifacts as earlier such as the people in the background but i gotta say this still looks like a really awesome effect all of this was captured here with just that 24 second clip and we can get a really awesome shot i decided let's see what it does with a quick bathroom selfie of my face. Here is a quick 16 second selfie clip that I took in the bathroom. Now it's surprisingly difficult to not track the moving camera with your eyes while you're waving your hand around your head. It might help to have something in front of you to focus your eyes so that you can keep everything as still as possible and reduce as many micro movements that you make. Anyways, here is the final result and I gotta say this looks super impressive. I love the detail and it actually captures every single individual beard hair. My skin and my eyes have reflectivity and true color and honestly being able to move around this in 3D is such a mind-blowing experience that it feels very different from looking at myself in a photo or a video. So as you can see, 3D Gaussian splatting is extremely flexible, creates amazing results, and I think you're gonna have a whole lot of fun playing around with it. What if we could capture movement, and what if we could still have the same photorealistic quality with moving subjects, capturing actual 3D living portraits almost like they do in high-tech sports arenas? Well. 4D Gaussian splatting promises just that and we'll cover that in a future video we're making so make sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss that when it comes out. In the meantime I highly recommend you check out our last video on a brand new AI video generator called Kling. We tested it out and got some very exciting results from it. Anyways thanks for watching hope to catch you in the next one. Alright peace.